it seems to me that Belpa goes through phases. We'd gone along as a little settlement, no more than that. For hundreds and hundreds of years, nothing much had happened. And then Strutt came, built his mills and wham! Suddenly it exploded out of all proportion. And it changed dramatically. The town of which I'm writing stands on a river's side. It has streets both crooked and narrow, and others straight and wide. It has mills and factories worked both by water and by steam, and high and costly warehouses like stately mansions seem. It has nail shops past my counting, where men and women toil, making round hoods, forties, clinkers for the tillers of the soil. Jedediah Strutt built the Unitarian Chapel. It was one of the first buildings he erected after he built his mills, because obviously he was a Unitarian. The chapel we think is about 1778, but by the time this was built, Jedediah had already died and his brother William, and they are buried underneath this catacomb. It has churches new and spacious, fitted up with bench and pew, and of dissenting chapels it contained not a few. It has workers, countless workers, at the anvil loom and frame, yet it holds no lordly mansion, though it boasts a titled name. It has gas in great abundance, and yet its streets are dark, and water bright and gushing at a fountain in the park. To create a community, they needed to go somewhere and socialise. And churches and chapels, of course, were a wonderful way of doing that in those early days. The only time in its early life that it was used for burials was when we had the plague and people were terrified of the spread of the disease. And so they buried them as soon as possible and as near as possible to where they died. So there were plague victims buried around the edge of the churchyard. It has doctors, clever doctors, who will potion and will pill you. And if they cannot cure you, be assured they will not kill you. Without the success of road building, of course, the businesses couldn't thrive because they couldn't get their goods out. But having said that, for centuries, of course, the nailers had taken their nails all over the country and even shipped them abroad. And they'd done that without a good road system. It has inns and beer shops plenty, where men have drunk and drowned their reason and their sorrows till their giddy brains went round. It has a fair and statuettes market and marketplace, which is a standing monument of somebody's disgrace. Many old roads were extended and improved, and so we started with these very fast, for the time, um, stagecoaches, which of course needed to change their horses regularly. At those stages along the route, they had to have coaching inns. And the Lion Hotel, the Red Lion as it was then on Bridge Street, uh, on the A6 as it is now, that road was built as a turnpike road in 1820. And the Red Lion extended its premises considerably to accommodate enough uh, stabling for coaches to call there. 
also the George and if you look at the George at the time it was known as the Georgian Dragon and if you look at it you can see how extensive the extension was to the building because there again uh, it had regular coaches throughout the day. Wherever you've got coaching roads you had highwaymen it's the nature of the business but people have certainly talked about Dick Turpin but then the same is said in other areas of England, so I don't know whether you can believe it or not, but they did say that he used to ride up Pincham's Hill and rob people up there. George Stevenson was the man who planned the railway through Belper, and of course it was a nightmare because Strutt had already built lots of housing for his workers. And the route of the railway lay through the middle of all this housing. It is a railway running through it, with trains both up and down, and a station house to walk to, near a mile from out of the town. But if you're in a hurry and are wishing off to start, the bus may take you just in time to see the train depart. And so that's why Belper has this amazing cutting running through it for one mile. It runs exactly a mile through Belper, through the centre of Belper. 1803, the Belper militia was formed. They had a firing range up on the Chevin on, by the Old North Road and they were formed in lots of places throughout the country. There were two reasons for it. One was that everybody was terrified that Bonaparte was about to come up on the shore and invade England and, and take it over. And the other thing was that um, there were the Luddites who were desperate people who'd lost their jobs due to the mechanisation of the Industrial Revolution and really could think no further than breaking up those machines and smashing the mills. And so every mill owner, such as Struts, were terrified that this was going to happen to their mills. Now, we've had a building revolution over the last, what, 40 years? and Belper's exploded again. Not because of industry, because the industry's gone, but people have moved into the town and they're giving us a fresh shot in the arm and perhaps that's what we need for the future. So now we've got to reinvent ourselves and think what the future is holding for us and what we can do. We're now part of a World Heritage Site, which is very exciting. I know they say you should always look to the future, but you know, a lot of lessons can be learned from the past, and I just hope that we do that. It is the town I cherish, all other towns above, for it holds those that love me and those I fondly love. <laughs>